thank you for coming to the Creative Cocktail Hour. Uh, I am going to turn my phone to silence uh, because I think you'll want to hear what uh, Peter Hay wants to talk about. Um, I would just want to say a few words beforehand here. Um, I have been the director of this organization for almost 24 years now, and I have never worked with any person that I considered my comrade and friend more than Peter Hay. And I'm going to miss the hell out of him. Um, we have a little token of our esteem from the board to give to you. So, we love Peter, let me just say that. And um, in the short time he's been here, he's made quite an impact on living arts. And some of the processes and things that we do organizationally, and for that we are eternally grateful. Uh, this young man, to be as young as he is, has more poise and more um, diplomacy than I will ever have <laughs> in all my years. So, you know, Peter, the board so I start no. <laughs> the board appreciates you, and we just wanted to acknowledge your contribution to Living Arts. And we couldn't think, I, one of the things I know about you, or I think I know, is that you always want to grow your art collection. And we couldn't think of a better way to send you to Durango than with a Diane Salmon original. No <laughs> kidding. Yes. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> so pull it out. It's uh, really been an honor to show here at Living Arts. I've had a few shows in the past year, but th this is, you know, really the, the pinnacle of my exhibition experience, being able to show somewhere like Living Arts in a gallery this size and getting to do something this crazy, and Steve letting me, um, mainly because he just didn't come out and look at it for a long time. <laughs> you know, he was, he was supportive. He said, yeah, do what you gotta do out there. Just, you know, remember that it has to look like a white wall afterwards. But, um, so this has been an incredible experience, and this piece was actually a collaboration with my daughter, Cora, over here, and there, there is absolutely no way it could have been done in time without a lot of help from my sister, Julia. Thank you. So, of, of so when this piece kind of all originated, um, from an artist talk and symposium panel discussion I heard in Portland last year at the NPN conference. There was a, a symposium on currents and contemporary indigenous artwork. And one of the artists that talked was Wendy Redstar. And she was getting ready for a show at the Portland Museum of Art. And she was, she'd taken this image, she had this idea to take this image that had been used for dime store novels and you know t-shirts and everything else for the past hundred years of uh, a Native American chief with full regalia, and she thought that really cheapened it. You know, this wasn't just like party garb or things to look nice. So she went through, she took these photographs of this, she took photocopies of this image and started circling and talking about why this was important, where this metal came from in his chest plate, you know, and her, at the time, her daughter was like six or seven, and kept coming into the studio and bugging her, and so finally she took a big 
handful of these photocopies and handed them to her and said, here, take these and color them and keep you busy, you know? And at the end of the studio session, she walked over and her daughter had colored all of these photocopies. And they were incredibly colorful and vibrant. She didn't stay in the lines. They were like an explosion. And it was, you know, it really was like a, a party about this chief. And she thought, you know what? I, this isn't about me. This isn't about me critiquing this 100 years of history. This is about the future, you know? So what she ended up doing was framing all of those uh, coloring, you know, and then giving her daughter some more of these photographs that she'd colored and hanging those as the exhibit um, as a way to honor the past and update the present and to look into the future. So I thought about that a lot as far as the work I've been making in the past and how sort of ominous and eerie it is. And I thought, you know what, there's gotta be a different, more playful way to go about this and what's a better place than living arts to do that. <laughs> so I started working with my daughter and talking about Oklahoma and Oklahoma's history. And we started talking about what, um, you know, what animals live here and what animals used to live here. And I was looking about this same time in January-ish, they uh, released like 180,000 photographs on New York's public library archives, digitized archives, and it actually invited artists to use them in some way. Um, so I saw that and I started searching through that for images from Oklahoma. And a lot of these odd structures and smoke plumes, those are all from the digitized archives. So as I went through those, I was pulling them out and I was drawing them and scanning them in and trying to figure out what I was gonna do with them and talking to Cora about them and then also bringing up the past, like this big you know, smoke plume that's been turned green. Um, I had to pull it out when I saw it because I, I remember this happening when I was a kid. I grew up in Pocket City, Oklahoma and uh, one morning, I think I was in the fourth or fifth grade and we, you know how you are in your kid, like there's always somebody looking out the window during class and somebody said, Oh man, look outside. And everybody ran to the window and there was a huge black smoke plume that was covering basically the whole west and north side of town. And come to find out there was actually an oil storage tank that was on fire. And of course they couldn't put it out. All they could do was keep it from spreading to the other tanks. And because of that, there was huge chunks of carbon and soot and everything just covering the town, dropping in everybody's front yards. And, um, so it gave me the inspiration to not just let this stuff stay on the wall, but to carry it out into the space. And um, so from that, we talked about these histories and things, and I started talking about Cora, to Cora about what the animals in Oklahoma were, and you know, she drew a horse over there, um, and she drew a cheetah and a cheetah cub, and I thought that was, and like when she drew the, the cheetah and the cheetah cub, I thought, I, I really just, just can't have restrictions on a six-year-old, you know, like that's, to me, it's like this essence of innocence that I, my whole view of this whole thing was so jaded. And then when she drew the cheetah and the cheetah cub, I thought, I need to go about this a completely different way. Like, I need to turn this into a playground, basically. Um, which, you know, when you think about the world and all that we do to it and have done to it and probably will do to it, we sort of treat it like a playground, you know? Um, and, you know, so if you look through it, you'll see her, her playful animals and um, her, her snake. Um, and at the same time, serendipitously, we had, we'd contacted the Met about helping for a show that actually happened in February, and the Met contacted us in March, you know, and said, hey, we'd like to work with you. <laughs> and I said, that's great, because I had something I wanted to do, um, but you missed the vote on the Rauschenberg show that was, or Rothstein's show that was in February. So I, I wanted to build these interesting objects and use them as essentially uh, you know, after all of this and the breakthrough that like I'm only being way too serious about this and thinking back to Wendy and the colorfulness and um, and they called and I said, I, there's something I can do with this. And I went and I sorted through their plastics. They were really nice about that. And I created these organic objects and um, I mean, they could be all sorts of organic things. Um, but essentially for me, what they are is an, kind of an organic representation of everything that is industrial and everything that's around us in a day-to-day -day life um, and they're transformed into something not only abstract but something that's carrying the narrative on the wall into the floor into our space um, and uh, you know just that full that full cycle of what they are where it comes from where it ends up and maybe where it's going
I mean, I could talk about this piece for a long time, but uh, some of the other pieces over here on the wall, I did some of these in graduate school, and then I made a few uh, post-graduate school. Um, and each of the pieces has its own sort of story. Am I killing you, Mary, with the camera? No, just go over there. You're great. <laughs> um, they kind of all have their own story, but as I paint them, as you can tell, they probably take a long time, so the stories sort of transition and mold in my head as I go. And the, uh, what they kind of become, once you have this initial idea and start designing, but then you work on them for 60 or 70 or 80 or 150 hours, is you become, they become a meditation of that thought or of that concept. So what happens if somebody asks me about these is I go on these long rants about, well, it was this, and then this, and then it was this, and this now maybe means this, but it's really up to you. So uh, each of them is sort of grounded in uh, reality, things that uh, are happening around us on a regular basis, but aren't really thought about too much or glossed over. So they're essentially exaggerated uh, statements of present time. Um, and a lot of the images, all these paintings, people always ask me, where do you get the images? And Google, you know? Uh, and they're, they're compilations of, you know, some of them are 10 or 15 images of, say, a moose or uh, a deer, and you you know, say, oh, I like the way that leg is, or I like the way that head is, and then going back and looking at the skeleton of the animal and figuring out how that all kind of fits together. And for me, that's a really fun process. Um, but, you know, really to start with like the whole process, I could talk about this piece over here, which is called, He Wasn't Always Like That. And this piece started, I was just sitting in my backyard one day drinking coffee, the sun was starting to come up, my dog was running around, and I look over and there was a bird sort of pecking through the leaves and, you know, having its morning constitutional too, you know, and I, uh, I didn't know what it was, so I started Googling it and I found one that looked like it and clicked on it and started searching and found out that it was uh, a black-capped chickadee or something like that. Uh, but then in that Google search, how you get all these images that pop up, one of them was really deformed with these huge beak and claws. And um, I really, like, I started looking into that then. That was sort of down the rabbit hole at that point. And, uh, you know, I found out all sorts of things, but they don't really know why it's happening. But it was really interesting to me that it was a keratin disorder because we have a lot of keratin parts. And, uh, you know, it makes you wonder, like, what if that happened to us, you know? Um, but then what I ended up doing was just taking a, a regular chickadee and a deformed chickadee and I took an image of a tree in my backyard and broke it down in Photoshop, exaggerated the colors, but then printed it um, with a reduction cut that had been laser cut. And for me it was just a way to kind of industrialize and simplify and process the landscape kind of like you see around you all the time um, and then place some, you know, kind of hypothetical results on top of it. So that's sort of the basis of a lot of this body of work is kind of systems and series and uh, research and then rabbit holes and then compiling imagery and um, it's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it. Are there any questions about any of these pieces or the mural? I, it, would you say that mutation is primarily your interest and how evolution uh, happens with uh, some of the toxicity that is going around? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's definitely a big element. Um, a lot of it is the unknown, though, because we don't know, and you, it's terribly difficult to track anything. Um, epidemiologists have a terrible time pinpointing any sort of like mutation to any sort of chemical. Um, especially since it once is out of the environment and thinned down. So to me that mystery is really interesting and terrifying and intriguing all at the same time. Um, and that for me is, uh, is kind of, I guess, what keeps me the exploration going. So you said you did all these at university. Are you still working on this series? Or do you I did, uh, yeah, I did three of these in university. I finished this one. I did this one in Oklahoma, um, but I haven't really, since then I did, when I first moved back to Oklahoma, I had a whole series of drainage ditches that I painted that were, you know, I got really interested once I moved back into like dissolvable urban karst and how like concrete changes the water, which changes the microbes. And, um, and then I had uh, 
several other projects that I worked on, some commissions and things, but um, for the most part, this is this was like graduate work with an addition of one. Um, and then some of these prints were done post-graduate school. But this is definitely, I still have stretcher bars that are unstretched. They're just the bars. Um, which I'm not looking forward to moving any of this. Uh, so if anybody wants a, a nice big painting, then you know, you're more than welcome. But, uh, but I have some ideas. I, um, I found that one of the really quick and easy ways to find out is to ask somebody who's a specialist. So I, um, <laughs> I know, right? It saves a whole lot of Googling and, you know, finding out that when you have an idea and then you talk to somebody who knows something about it, they're like, well, that's not exactly how it happens. This is how it happens. Uh, so I made friends with a guy named Kelby Uchley in north central Louisiana, and he, had a, he was a retired um, fish and wildlife agent, and he had a show on NPR called Bayou Diversity, and he would just do these, like, two-minute segments. But he, I, I love that guy. He's one of my favorite people still to this day. And, um, since then, I've, I've interviewed some people around Tulsa and uh, like the Deep Fork Wild, uh, National Wildlife Refuge that's south of Tulsa. I've talked to some of the, the agents that work there about some of the different things that are happening in the environment. So I have, I have some more ideas to, to go after. But thematically. Thematically, yeah. But this, this whole piece really took up a lot of time and effort and I had all sorts of little mock-ups that I did and sketches. but. In the end, you know, a lot of that stuff went out the window and you just kind of like have to react to how it is on the wall. But, um, Do you feel like it's impactful to people in the community to, that's what I've always wondered, you know, we all in the arts oh, yeah. we have social concerns. Yeah. Do you feel like your work has impacted and as a result of that? You know, it's interesting because one of the things Steve and I were actually talking about this earlier, which is like preaching to the choir, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons I took this tact with this work is that it's very approachable. Mm -hmm. And in Louisiana, I could have somebody's dad who was a farmer come up and talk about the work. And it was a really nice entry point. And we'd have like common ground on like, oh yeah, the pigs are hanging out in my fields, you know? Yeah. And then we could like talk about what that means on maybe a different scale than yeah. just his fields or, you know, some of my ideas and generally they'd leave going, that guy's a crazy liberal, you know? But it was because to have a conversation, you know? And, uh, and this work was definitely approachable for a lot of people for that reason. And, um, that was the, the main, I guess, drive when I first started the, uh, these paintings in this way. Because before that I was doing more abstract pieces with printmaking and things. And it was, people liked them, but this stuff is like, you know, it, it's in the collective conscious of art, like this type of painting. So, but it's a little off and people then are curious and it seems to uh, be a nice entryway. But it's always art that makes you talk. That's true. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> nice. There's another interlude here coming up. <laughs> I think you'll have lots of uh, subject matter in Colorado. That, I, I think I know where that is. It's sort of east of here, isn't it? Colorado? Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. yeah. You go far enough. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. You know, all the strip mining and all the, the mining that's oh, yeah. been done there will undoubtedly be good fodder for you. Definitely. One of the things that happened uh, two years ago was, I guess it was about two years ago, was the EPA had a boo-boo and they broke a big dam from a reserve uh, mining lake or pool and flooded like 300 billion gallons worth of ga uh, water down the Ananas River and turned it orange from, you know, where it broke like down to the Navajo Reservation and it was a huge mess. They just uh, reopened the river there. Um, last summer, I believe. So there's a little fodder there for sure. And you know, there's some, some history to the, to the landscape to explore. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, well thank you, Peter, very much.